thinking about maintaining biodiversity in a working landscape, I think it would be very uh, useful if the, the speakers and the, the questioners could also think about the relationship between the different environmental acts. I and mean, we've been focusing obviously primarily on the ESA, but once you get to talk about biodiversity in a working landscape, uh, there obviously is an important role for a range of other environmental acts, the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, and a number of other acts like that. Uh, so I think that could be useful if we would spend a bit of time thinking about uh, that and that relationship there. And indeed about uh, what in some sense is the, the really big question behind all of this, which is how do we stop species from getting, being endangered in the first place? Um, which is obviously one of the issues that arises when you talk about maintaining biodiversity on a working landscape. So potentially we've got a very big and very interesting agenda here. And we've got some very interesting speakers to address it. Uh, we're starting off uh, with uh, Barton Thompson, also known as Buzz Thompson, um, who's the uh, Robert Paradise Professor of Natural Resources Law at Stanford Law School. He's also Vice Dean of that law school, and he's Director of Stanford's Natural Resource Law and Policy Program. Uh, he has a range of, an impressive range actually, of degrees from Stanford, including degrees in economics, law, and business. I'm making a remarkably versatile background. Uh, he's law, he clerked uh, to the Chief Justice William Rehnquist, and his research and writings focus on uh, legal issues of water, biodiversity, and fishers, fisheries policy. Uh, Buzz will talk, then it will be followed by a, a brief presentation from, by Paul Armsworth and Carrie Kappel, uh, also from Stanford, and we'll introduce them uh, at the end of Buzz's talk. Buzz. I need all the time that I possibly can get here. It's, that's right. It's uh, normally uh, a privilege to be the cleanup um, uh, Sumerian for a uh, conference of this nature. But that is unless you follow Shahid uh, as, the, uh, as the last one. Dale Goble came up to me yesterday afternoon and said, well, I hope you're going to be at least as entertaining as uh, Shahid was. Uh, but unfortunately, lawyers are trained uh, to be unentertaining. Um, I thought last night about maybe if I could just change my physical appearance, maybe I would do a better job. Uh, following again Shahid's uh, uh, lead, I went to the uh, uh, local piercing shop. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, during the winter months, they close early, so I was not able able to get my, uh, my earring. Um, as I told people at uh, my dinner table the other night about the only uh, uh, thing that I used to do entertaining was I would start out all of my talks with lawyer jokes. Uh, but the problem was that the uh, lawyers in the crowd uh, never thought they were particularly funny, and the non-lawyers in the crowd never realized they were jokes. Uh, so I no longer uh, uh, do that. So what I'm going to do is sort of rush through uh, a detailed overview of all the various papers uh, in Section 3. Uh, and Section 3 now has the title of Maintaining Biodiversity on the Working Landscape. But I actually added to the uh, front of that our original topic, which was Beyond Reserves, because I think a number of the papers talk not only about what we might be doing on the working landscape, but whether or not there are other techniques that we should be uh, uh, endeavoring to use uh, to promote, uh, to restore uh, biodiversity uh, in addition to uh, uh, working uh, landscape management. So if I can figure out how to uh, use this. First of all, a commercial uh, announcement. Uh, this presentation is based on a total of eight papers by 14 authors, many of whom are here today, uh, but many of whom are still home working on their papers. <laughs> Yesterday, uh, at, the, uh, uh, at the very uh, uh, outset, uh, it was mentioned that before the Endangered uh, Species Act, uh, that the strategy of the United States in preserving wildlife uh, was a reserve strategy. Uh, and so this particular slide shows all of the national wildlife refuges uh, in the United States. Uh, but Holly Doremus's implication by mentioning that was that the Endangered Species Act had gone beyond that particular approach. And one of the questions I think we need to talk about today is whether or not the Endangered Species Act really has taken anything other than a reserve approach. There are a variety of different types of protective measures uh, that you could imagine the government taking. One is setting aside reserves. Uh, second of all is trying to shape the footprint uh, of development. A third is actually regulating the uses of the working landscapes. And we have a variety of different types of working landscapes, all of which raise different issues. So we're dealing with the working countryside, agriculture and ranching, working forests, uh, the cityscape, which would include landscaping and urban parks. We also could imagine affirmatively improving the habitat potential of working landscapes. 
The last bullet point was the notion of trying to restrict the way in which the working landscape is utilized. So, for example, regulating the use of uh, various forms of chemicals on the working landscape. One could imagine, though, going beyond that and actually trying to change the way in which the working landscape is used in an affirmative fan, uh, uh, manner in order to uh, uh, improve its bio, uh, biodiversity potential. Another possibility is that you could even imagine regulating the broader impacts uh, of development. So rather than looking at development per se, think about the various impacts away from the site of development on biodiversity. So to the degree that you uh, develop a new subdivision, that new subdivision is not only going to have local impacts, but it is also going to consume water, it is also going to use other resources from a distance away. You could also imagine focusing on those as part of development measures. What have we done, however, under the um, uh, Endangered Species Act? Well, we focused a lot on setting aside reserves. We've also done a pretty good job uh, of looking at working for us, although my guess is, is that we find some forest companies that have done a better job under the Endangered Species Act than others here. We've done a little bit in order to shape the footprints uh, in some areas such as Southern California. But virtually all of the other measures that we could imagine taking under the Endangered Species Act, we still have failed to do anything under the ESA uh, itself. One of the things that I did in my paper was to look at the way in which we're actually utilizing the private land provisions of the Endangered Species Act, sections 9 and 10. One of the things that I found was that sections 9 and 10 are not surprisingly focused primarily on major land changes. So that they've been focused on land development, they've been focused on timber harvesting. There are no published cases out there right now involving the regular uses of the working uh, countryside. That isn't to say that there aren't other sections of the Endangered Species Act, such as Section 7, uh, or uh, following in uh, uh, with Jeff's question, uh, other statutes such as sec Section 404 of the Clean Water Act, which haven't impacted uh, the working countryside, agriculture, uh, and ranching. But Sections 9 and 10 do not appear to have had much of an impact. In addition to looking to see what the Fish and Wildlife Service is doing in the way of enforcement actions under sections 9 and 10. Well, actually, before that, let me just suggest there are various reasons why uh, you would expect that it would be difficult for the Fish and Wildlife Service to do very much under sections uh, 9 and 10. First of all, there are various legal limitations uh, in the way in which Section 9 can be exercised. So that Section 9 restricts only significant habitat modification that actually kills or injures a member of the species. And the Ninth Circuit in the Arizona Cattle Growers Association case in the year 2000 ruled that unless you actually can find a member of a species on the land itself, then you do not have Section 9 authority. That creates a fairly significant hurdle uh, for the federal government to, well, uh, to overcome or for environmental groups to overcome in trying to use Section 9 actively uh, to manage the um, uh, working landscape. In addition to that, as people like Michael Bean have uh, emphasized, Section 9 only restricts activities uh, that injure, kill, etc., endangered species. Section 9 cannot be used to mandate uh, owners of the working countryside to actually take affirmative actions. In addition to that, even if you don't have the legal limitations, it's difficult for the Fish and Wildlife Service with the resources it has to actively monitor the working uh, uh, landscape and to try to enforce any limitations on the working landscape. So in addition to taking a look at the enforcement use of sections uh, 9 and 10, I also took a look at habitat conservation plans. And as been mentioned, there are something in the nature of 400 or more habitat conservation plans uh, in the United States today. Uh, here's, by the way, one of the problems with the uh, statistics uh, that are kept by the Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, when I want, went on to the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service hi, uh, site back in uh, uh, July, uh, they reported that they had approved 429 habitat conservation plans. Uh, going on just the other day, that number has declined uh, to 407 uh, habitat conservation uh, plans. Uh, and to my knowledge, that many have not been disapproved uh, during that uh, period of time. The planning area, uh, at least in theory, uh, looks quite uh, impressive. But one thing to keep in mind is that 
uh, the balance of habitat conservation plans uh, amongst the various uh, uh, states uh, is quite skewed, so that you find something in the nature of 40 percent of all of the habitat conservation plans have come from Texas, uh, and those have come from the Balcones region uh, of Texas in the 1990s, and more recently from uh, uh, the Houston Toad habitat uh, region of Texas. Virtually all of those habitat conservation plans involve the construction of a single home, uh, on a very small parcel of, um, uh, of property. Uh, so in truth, we, I think, frequently overestimate uh, how frequently habitat conservation plans uh, are utilized under the Endangered uh, uh, Species Act. More importantly, though, Habitat conservation plans have followed uh, a relatively singular uh, uh, model. And in particular, they have generally followed the model of the very first habitat conservation plan, which was mentioned yesterday, uh, which was the San Bruno Mountain HCP uh, in uh, uh, Northern California, which was the uh, site uh, habitat of a number of endangered uh, butterflies uh, and was threatened uh, by uh, residential uh, subdivisions. The San Bruno Mountain HCP was a reserve model. Uh, the ultimate uh, uh, theory behind uh, the HCP was that you would permit a little bit of land to be developed and the rest you would set aside in a reserve. So 14% of the land was ultimately developed, 84% was set aside as an open space uh, preserve for butterfly habitat, uh, including a small uh, uh, fund uh, to help manage uh, that particular uh, uh, habitat. If you look at HCPs since then, they look very similar to the San Bruno uh, HCP. So first of all, if you look at what types of land uses individual HCPs uh, have uh, used, what you find is that most of them deal with various forms of residential development. Single family development, multi-unit development, other uh, uh, real estate uh, developments significant amount for timber, a growing amount for uh, recreational uses, development of trails and the likes on uh, local and state parks, virtually nothing in the working countryside. In fact, during this uh, uh, period of time, as I'll get to in a moment, there have been only a total of four individual HCPs uh, that have dealt with the uh, working uh, countryside. So why is that? Well, from the standpoint of a farmer or rancher, Entering into an individual HCP is very costly and time consuming. For the reasons which I mentioned a moment ago, most farmers and ranchers feel little of any regulatory pressure to actually enter into an individual uh, uh, habitat conservation plan. If you go to the Fish and Wildlife Service and talk to them about, there's the possibility of actually attracting regulatory attention that you wouldn't attract uh, if you just sat back and went about your normal uh, uh, business. And so, as I mentioned, there's been only four countryside HCPs in the history of the Endangered Species Act, and all of them have involved unique situations uh, where landowners who, for example, are farmers are also thinking about developing some of their land, uh, or they are using both private and public land and have really been pulled into the HCP process process uh, through the use of uh, uh, Section uh, 7. Also interestingly, if you look at individual HCPs and look at the type of minimization and mitigation measures uh, that they incorporate, by far the most common form of minimization and mitigation is on-site reserves, off-site reserves, more commonly, uh, recently, credits in various types of mitigation uh, banks. Very few of them have incorporated uh, a landscape approach uh, to preserving the biodiversity, uh, and an even smaller percentage have combined uh, these various uh, approaches. So why the reserve bias? Uh, my thesis is that one of the reasons is that it is in everyone's interest to take a reserve approach. From the standpoint of the landowner and developers, reserves are a one-time event. They're not particularly intrusive in your future uses of the uh, land. From the government standpoint, they're relatively easy to enforce. And there's a perception that there's greater scientific understanding and certainty about how we can protect biodiversity using reserves uh, than, uh, uh, than trying 
trying to manage the working landscape. Similarly, from the standpoint of environmental NGOs, it's far easier to monitor reserves than it is to monitor what's happening on the working landscape. And there's also, again, a perception of greater scientific understanding and certainty. One of the things I also looked at was what of regional uh, HCPs. So as we discussed yesterday, in addition to the individual HCPs, we have also moved in a direction uh, of having uh, multiple species, uh, multi-developer uh, HCPs. Uh, and as uh, uh, Dan Tarlick uh, has discussed, uh, these new regional HCPs, NCCPs, involve more extensive involvement uh, of uh, local government. Now, in theory, these regional HCPs have the potential for more attention to the working landscape. You might imagine, for example, the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, in approving a regional HCP, might insist on the inclusion of the working countryside. Also, the local government has greater authority uh, over working uh, landscapes and might also favor the flexibility that trying to regulate the working landscape would use because it might run into fewer Fifth Amendment uh, problems. In fact, however, if you look at regional HCPs, there is, again, little participation uh, by farmers and ranchers, a little bit more than there is in the case of individual HCPs, but still very little. And frequently, in fact, farmers actually abandon the process halfway through when they realize that the regional HCP actually might cost them something. Uh, and uh, uh, in addition, there's a strong but not universal uh, reserve uh, bias. Now, this has led a variety of people, including Mike Rosenzweig, uh, in his paper for uh, uh, this section, to suggest that we need to go beyond the reserve strategy that we find under the Endangered Species Act. Uh, and Michael uses the term restoration ecology. This is a quotation from his paper where what he suggests is that we have to figure out a way of reconciling human and non-human uses of habitat by inventing, establishing, and maintaining new habitats uh, where people live uh, and play uh, together. Now, why should we look beyond reserves? Why should we be concerned if the Endangered Species Act takes a largely uh, reserve approach? Uh, the papers in this section suggest a variety of different reasons. Uh, some, I think, are more convincing uh, than others. Uh, different reasons lead to slightly different strategies. Uh, and in some cases, I think they might even conflict. And so one of the things that we might want to do later is to try to parse through each of the various reasons why we might want to move beyond on reserves and talk about what strategies would work for each. But very quickly, the reasons which are suggested uh, in this section is that first of all, reserves ultimately are not going to be biologically effective. That in many cases, the size of the reserves are simply inadequate. And that furthermore, unless the reserves are part of a larger landscape that has been configured uh, to help the species, uh, the reserves are going to be unsuccessful. Uh, the second of all, the reserves are going to be biologically unsustainable, uh, either because of habitat change, this is global warming, which is going to make a reserve which you set aside in year one not viable any longer in year 20, or because of externalities, activities outside of the reserve which will impinge on the effectiveness of the reserve. Uh, the bringing in of predators, the use of chemical contaminants, various other forms of external disturbances. Some papers also suggest that we need to look beyond reserves for economic reasons, that to the degree that we can uh, actually uh, provide habitat for species on the working landscape rather than setting aside reserves, then we don't have to face uh, the expense of actually going out, purchasing land, uh, and taking it out of uh, uh, economic uh, use. There's also a suggestion in some of the papers that a working landscape approach would be politically more acceptable. That to the degree, again, you can go into a region and tell the region you're not going to be taking land out of use, but finding ways of both using the land and using it as habitat, that would be politically more acceptable. Also a suggestion that reserves uh, are not politically sustainable. Uh, that over time, as development pressure builds up, uh, that people are going to be looking at that reserve more and more closely and thinking, how can we take it out of reserve status uh, and use it for development purposes? And then finally, and this builds actually on some of the work that Holly Doremus has done uh, in the past, a suggestion that to the degree that we can uh, use uh, the working landscape uh, as habitat, that we might be promoting conservation ethics uh, by having people actually work and live in the same environment as the species uh, themselves. But this then begs the question of what if any opportunities actually exist out there 
uh, for helping to preserve habitats uh, on the uh, working landscape. Uh, and this is the uh, subject of Barry Brossi's Gretchen Daly and Frank Davis's uh, contribution to this particular section. Uh, as they point out, our understanding in this area is still in its infancy. Uh, conservation biology, just like the Endangered Species Act, has had a reserve bias uh, in the uh, past. Previous studies show some scattered promise. Uh, so, for example, some studies suggest that in the agricultural area, if you have diverse land cover and you're preserving at least 15% of the native, native habitat, that you can also support the native fauna. But on the other hand, that if you have a monocultural agricultural operation, uh, and you have less than 10% of the nat native habitat uh, preserved, uh, then you're going to be unsuccessful in using that land uh, as habitat. Uh, their study also suggests that we need to be cautious uh, in how we approach reconciliation uh, ecology. Uh, and an example here is the Netherlands experience, uh, where 20% of the farmland uh, for approximately two decades now uh, has been under uh, active environmental management. And yet the most recent findings show that the diversity is no greater on that 20% of the farmland than under the land which is not being environmentally uh, uh, managed. So Brassi Daly and uh, uh, Davis then uh, took the California Wildlife Habitat Relationships Database, uh, which looks at all 675 California terrestrial vertebrates uh, and their habitat affinities, and also the California Gap Analysis, and looked to see what we know about, at least in California, where uh, species and endangered uh, uh, species uh, live. Uh, and what this particular uh, uh, overhead shows, if I can, if I'm doing the right thing here, yeah, is, and now how do I get rid of escape, okay, where's the escape button? Oh, there we go, okay, great. So what this particular uh, uh, slide shows, again, this is part of their uh, uh, findings, is that not surprisingly you find the most species in the native habitat, uh, fewer species in the agricultural uh, area, and even fewer in the uh, uh, urban. That's the bad side. The good side, though, is that if you actually look at the protected species, and they've defined protected species very broadly, you find even in the urban and the agricultural uh, environments uh, a fair amount of the uh, uh, protected uh, species. They also looked at species richness uh, by uh, uh, habitat uh, group, again, looking at both protected species on the one hand and non-protected uh, species uh, on the other. And what they found, again, not surprisingly, is that the protected species uh, are far more frequently to live only in the uh, uh, native uh, habitat. But again, there is a significant amount of even the protected species uh, that uh, have as their habitat not only the uh, native habitat, but in addition to that, agricultural and uh, urban habitat, this area here. What again you seldom find uh, are any species uh, that have as their habitat only agricultural uh, or urban uh, lands. In addition to that, they also separated out species uh, between non-vagile, is that the correct term, Frank? Uh, and uh, vagile organisms. Uh, this is a new terminology for, uh, for me as a lawyer. Vagile uh, organisms being those organisms uh, uh, that have a high dispersal uh, ability. So they separated out the organisms in the vagile organisms are basically the birds and the bats. The non-vagile uh, uh, organisms are reptiles and amphibians. Uh, mammals are left out of this because of the difficulty of actually distinguishing uh, between the vagile and non-vagile uh, mammals uh, in this particular uh, uh, database. And again, not surprisingly, what you find is, is that if you look over here at A, which is the, uh, uh, which is the non-vagile organisms, you have about 75% of those uh, organisms that survive only in the native habitat. Whereas, on the other hand, when you look at those that can disperse more widely, uh, you find a small, uh, far smaller percentage uh, that survive only on the native habitat and a significantly greater uh, percentage uh, that survive on multiple forms of uh, uh, habitats. So what are the potential policy lessons uh, of these findings? Uh, first of all, that farmland conservation is important. 
uh, to the degree that we can preserve farmland rather than having it urbanized, uh, that we may be able to provide greater habitat potential uh, for endangered uh, species and biodiversity more generally. Second of all, that we need much greater scientific research in this area uh, to determine what particular species we might be able to protect on the working landscape, to determine what are the most effective management practices, and to think about the various trade-offs that might exist between reserve size on the one hand uh, and landscape management uh, on the other. And then finally, they suggest that we need greater coordination between planners uh, and conservation uh, biologists. Now, how can we obtain uh, better management on the working landscape, assuming that we decide that this is the direction that we want to well, uh, head? Uh, first of all, again, as was just suggested, we need aggressive new field research in this area. We need more effective use of the Endangered Species Act, and I'll come back and talk about this in more detail in a moment. We should turn to city and local management, both because there's greater political support here, uh, there's greater authority, and there's greater ability to analyze and monitor uh, the use of the working landscape. And again, I'll come back and talk more about this in a second. Uh, we should think about voluntarism. Uh, particularly from an incremental uh, approach where you get farmers, ranchers, and others to take small steps first. Psychological studies suggest that makes them more likely to then go on in uh, future years and take larger steps. We need to eliminate perverse subsidies uh, that, for example, encourage urban sprawl, and we need to use incentives, uh, and I will come back again and talk in a few minutes about incentives in conservation uh, banking. First of all, what opportunities exist under the Endangered Species Act? As I suggested earlier, the Endangered Species Act has followed a primarily reserve approach, but there are examples out there of how we've used the Endangered Species Act uh, to effectively manage uh, uh, biodiversity uh, on the working landscape. One of the best examples, and one that Jimmy Christensen, uh, who's here from the state of Wisconsin, can provide us with more information about uh, later, is the Carner Blue Butterfly Regional uh, HCP, which is actually state-wide. Uh, this is a pure working landscape HCP. Uh, they're dealing here uh, with a species uh, that relies upon uh, uh, disturbed uh, habitat. Uh, and they have set up a system involving 30 public and private uh, partners who are large uh, uh, landowners covering 250,000 acres to engage in active land management including prescribed fires, grazing, and herbicide treatment, and then encouraging voluntary participation from a wide variety of other uh, participants. Uh, the Pima County Sonora Desert Conservation uh, Plan, uh, which Maven uh, discussed yesterday, is another example uh, of an HCP which actually tries to actively incorporate uh, the urban agricultural landscape uh, into uh, uh, its management. Uh, another uh, approach to using the working landscape uh, is the approach which is being followed by the Natomas Basin uh, HCP, uh, which is the home of endangered hawks uh, and snakes. Uh, this is just north of Sacramento, again uh, facing uh, suburban uh, encroachment. Uh, and here what the HCP tries to do is to integrate the working landscape into the HCP uh, reserve itself. So that the HCP proposes a 9,000 uh, acre reserve. 50% of that reserve can be rice farms. Another 25 can consist of upland row crops and fallowed agricultural uh, lands. And those farmlands must be managed to enhance wildlife values uh, and control predators. Uh, this is a, a HCP, uh, which is more interesting and potentially more disturbing uh, than, for example, the Blue uh, Carner Butterfly HCP, because here's an HCP that is actually looking at a trade-off uh, between the working landscape uh, and the reserve, so that there's a potential that 75% of the reserve itself will be working landscape, and so one of the questions that you have to ask here is how effectively will that working landscape uh, protect the um, uh, species. Uh, safe harbors uh, are another measure under the Endangered Species Act uh, where uh, we are managing uh, the uh, uh, working landscape. Uh, a good example is the Gulf Coast Prairies uh, Safe Harbor Agreement uh, that is being used to help uh, promote uh, Atwater's Greater Prairie Chicken. Uh, and here various activities including cattle grazing, prescribed burns, and vegetation uh, management uh, are actually benefiting uh, the, uh, uh, the species.
And again, if you look at this pie chart over here, which shows uh, the various types of land uses involved in safe harbor agreements, unlike with the HCPs, where you found very little agricultural participation, here over 40% uh, of the HCPs uh, involve agricultural uh, land. But we have a limited potential to the safe harbors in that really all they can do is eliminate the perverse incentives rather than uh, uh, to engage in affirmative action uh, of their uh, own. Another area where you actually find a lot of uh, management of the working countryside are candidate conservation agreements, uh, which are today growing faster uh, than HCPs. Uh, and here again, you have a high focus uh, on the uh, working countryside. So again, looking at this pie chart uh, over here, this green area here, which is about one-fifth of the pie chart, uh, is the percentage of CCAs that deal only uh, with agricultural land. Uh, then you have another 34% of the CCAs uh, that deal partly uh, with agricultural land. So about 50% of the CCAs now uh, actually involve management uh, of the uh, working uh, uh, countryside. Uh, the reason is why do you see this more here than in the area of HCPs? I think there are a variety of potential reasons. First of all, you have much greater state and local involvement, which makes it easier to implement uh, and monitor management of the uh, working uh, countryside. Also, you have much greater trust uh, between the local agencies and the landowners than you do with the federal government. Uh, also, farmers and ranchers face lower negotiation and implement implementation costs. Uh, there's less compulsion involved here, which of course is also uh, a detriment, uh, and there's significant use of incentives. The real issue, however, is how effective uh, these CCAs will be. In uh, Tim Beatley's uh, paper, um, Tim is actually somebody who's dear to a lawyer's heart because he's somebody who, as far as I can tell, believes that the uh, multiple of anecdote is data. Uh, and so Tim gives a lot of good anecdotes about what's actually happening uh, at the city and uh, uh, local level. Uh, gives a variety of examples including cities such as Arcata, California and Chicago, Illinois that are taking active steps to try and make their cities uh, more supportive uh, of biodiversity. Uh, and Tim suggests a variety of biodiversity steps uh, that cities can take, starting with conducting biodiversity inventories, then developing biodiversity plans or strategies, which can include such measures as urban compactness, restoring watersheds, uh, trying to take impervious uh, streets and changing them into green streets. Uh, again, daylighting surface streams and creeks by removing impervious uh, layers, building designs, landscapings, on uh, reduction of chemical uh, uh, use. Uh, and also talks about how cities have adopted various green procurement policies to try to reduce their total footprint uh, on the ecology. Again, one of the potential measures that if we're going to work with the working landscape we have to think about are various types of incentives. But one major issue, which is the most difficult issue we hardly ever address, is where might we actually be able to find funding uh, for incentives. One possibility which was discussed yesterday is looking at existing subsidy uh, programs. And here one question is the degree to which we can take existing subsidy programs and reallocate those subsidy monies rather than simply expanding the total pot of subsidies and taking that expanded amount and dedicating it to biodiversity. Second of all, again, as was suggested yesterday, local bond measures are very popular uh, today, might be a significant source. And then third of all, we need to start thinking about the various types of co-benefits that we might be able to use to encourage taxpayers and others to contribute money uh, to uh, uh, protection of the working landscape. These include ecosystem services, aesthetics, human health, economic competitiveness and quality of life, and historical and cultural uh, resources. We also need to think about how we might be able to make incentives better and smarter. Uh, right now, we have a large number of very disparate incentive uh, programs, both public uh, and private. Uh, so it's very, very difficult for landowners to actually determine what incentives are available out there. Uh, and frequently, these incentive programs uh, can undercut uh, each other. Uh, 
We also need to reduce the administrative costs of the incentive programs. A number of incentive programs don't involve a lot of money, involve so much paperwork from the standpoint of the property owner uh, that they don't pursue them. Finally, we need to think about ways of redirecting unneeded incentives. Frequently, we're paying incentives right now to people who might very well take actions without uh, the incentives or might be willing to take actions uh, at a lower level of incentive. So we need to think about things such as reverse auctions, uh, which are used under the Conservation Reserve Program, where we actually ask property owners to bid for the incentives. Uh, and we then give the incentives to those people uh, who ask for the least amount of incentive uh, for a given amount of uh, conservation work. We also need to think more carefully about the award criteria uh, for our various incentive programs to make sure that they're actually accomplishing uh, what we want. Finally, there are two papers uh, in, uh, uh, in this particular uh, uh, set of chapters, uh, including one by Jeff Heal, also one by Jessica Fox, me, and Gretchen Daly, looking at uh, conservation banks. Very quickly, there are several score of conservation banks that are now in operation. Uh, Eighteen of them are outside California. There are actually several dozen conservation banks uh, here in California uh, alone. And these conservation banks vary tremendously uh, in their detail. So they vary in uh, uh, who operates them. Most frequent operator are private operators, but you also find governmental agencies and NGOs uh, operating the conservation banks. Uh, they vary in the way in which credits can be used. Uh, most do permit external sales of the credits, but a number have been set up just for internal mitigation. The currency uh, varies quite significantly. So some conservation banks use their currency habitat uh, acreage. Uh, so to the degree that you purchase uh, acreage in a conservation bank, then you can develop uh, your own. Now that's new. I've heard them ringing before, but I've never heard one dialing out. Um, you also find, though, that some of the conservation banks use as their currency species members. Uh, so you can develop property in return for actually uh, supporting species uh, on another piece of property. You also find clusters, nesting groups used as currency. Uh, the ratios uh, vary, but the most common ratio is one to one uh, for intracurrency uh, trades. Uh, and interestingly enough, you also find uh, that they vary in the other potential uses uh, of the bank. Uh, so the banks are frequently not pure reserves, uh, but frequently allow for various forms of recreation, hunting, uh, grazing, and timber harvesting. So why should we uh, care about conservation banks? What's the potential promise of conservation banks? Here are the papers, again, suggest a variety of purposes, all of which I think need to be further studied uh, and analyzed. One possibility is that the conservation banks can encourage earlier protection uh, of species. You don't have to wait until somebody has proposed a development in order to preserve land. You can do it beforehand through the conservation bank. They can lead to larger and more cohesive preservation efforts and in doing so enjoy economies of scale. Uh, they can be more effective uh, at providing preservation at lower uh, costs. To the degree that they can reduce compliance costs, uh, they'll also reduce uh, political uh, opposition. They can change landowner incentives by actually uh, uh, making it uh, worthwhile for uh, uh, some landowners uh, to find species uh, on their property. But there's still the question of under the conservation banking whether or not we're really just fiddling at the margins uh, or whether or not this is going to make a significant uh, difference. Some of the issues uh, that the papers look at with respect to conservation uh, bank issues uh, are, first of all, currencies. I think this is probably the most important uh, issue here. One question is, what's the appropriate currency uh, for conservation uh, banks? Do you want to measure conservation banks in terms of the input? That would be habitat so that you permit somebody to develop a piece of property in return for creating input for biodiversity preservation elsewhere, habitat? Or do you want to measure it more in terms of performance? So for example, the actual number of clusters of a species that you protect on a particular property. The issues involved in choosing between those two different types of currency would include the certainty of the species effect that you get. So habitat provides less certainty than performance. The reversibility the various types of co-benefits you get. So to the degree you're looking at performance, you'll probably get less co-benefits than with respect to habitat. 
uh, and the genetic diversity that you're trying to achieve. So again, to the degree you set aside habitat, it might protect a larger number of species than uh, conservation banks, which are focused specifically on single uh, species. Also need to look at both intercurrency trade issues, how do you determine the trade-off between, for example, habitat and clusters? And look at intracurrency uh, trade-offs, in particular here the appropriateness of a one-to-one -one, uh, ratio. One of the things that Jeff Heal talks about here also is the degree to which we might be able to leverage conservation banks uh, by, for example, uh, lowering the cost of setting up the conservation banks through various types of tax deductions. And here again, Going back again to the working landscape, we need to think about how we might be able to set up conservation banks with various types of co-uses uh, so that we are not only setting aside reserves as part of the banks, uh, but we're also supporting uh, the working use of that particular land. So with that, I'm going to change directions entirely and turn things over, Rob, uh, to Paul Armsworth, who's a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Conservation Biology at Stanford, uh, and to sort of balance out the lawyers as two PhDs, uh, one in math and one in biology. Uh, and Paul's going to be focusing on marine uh, HCPs, an issue, again, which we haven't spent much time talking about so far. So I was uh, one of several people in the audience who um, found themselves, this time last year, sat in a yurt, partly trying to work out what I was doing sat in a yurt, but also trying to think about what I could offer to discussions about the ESA. Um, and while I was sat there, there were slides going past of numbers of endangered freshwater fishes, numbers of amphibians, numbers of bird species, and someone had the temerity to ask, are any fully marine species listed? And there was a sort of an embarrassed silence and a sort of a yes, maybe some answer came back. So having never worked on this before, I thought that would be a topic I could at least have a look at and see if we get some answers on. Now, I've worked on this with uh, three co-authors, Carrie Kappel, who's going to speak to you in a second, and Fiorenza Michelli, who are at our marine station in Hopkins, um, and Eric Bjorkstedt, who's at NOAA Fisheries in Santa Cruz. By way of a quick introduction, hopefully these things are self-evident, um, marine ecosystems cover a huge area. So the total area inside the EEZ is larger than the total area of land under federal jurisdiction. And that area contains a huge diversity of habitats. So obviously there are, there are benthic habitats like coral reefs, mangroves, kelp forests and rocky shores, but there are also important oceanographic habitats as well, such as frontal convergence zones and upwelling regions. Now that diversity of habitats allows marine ecosystems to support a uh, very rich biodiversity. Now if we look at higher taxonomic levels, marine ecosystems are much richer than our terrestrial or freshwater ecosystems. So looking at the uh, phyla, um, 36 out of 37 animal phyla are represented in the sea, 64% of them are exclusively marine. That compares with 3% of phyla that are only terrestrial and none that are exclusively freshwater. If we come down taxonomic level, levels though and look at species, the picture reverses and 15% of all described species are marine. Um, not only are they rich in biodiversity, they provide us with valuable ecosystem services. Uh, the 53% of the population living in coastal counties obtain important aesthetic and recreational benefits from the marine environment. It obviously supports very important fisheries. The 2001 commercial landings from, reported by NOAA were 4.3 million metric tons or $3.2 billion dockside. Um, and obviously also a key role in global nutrient cycling. And lastly, by way of an introduction, our marine ecosystems are in trouble. Um, there have been two recent uh, commissions looking at the state of the marine environment. I'll talk about those later on, and they respectively conclude they're in crisis and in trouble. So they're large, uh, rich in diversity, both habitats and species. They're important in providing ecosystem services, uh, and they're in trouble and need our attention. Um, Carrie's going to talk to you about the history of listings under the ESA. So by our most uh, recent accounting, there are 68 marine species or DPSs that have been listed under ESA. Um, and if you discount the uh, initial flurry of activity uh, upon creation of the Act, there's been an increase in listings of marine species through time. There's also uh, an increase in the number of marine species that have ended up on the candidate list. Um, a number of these species have been on there for several years. There's some question as to whether they ever come off the candidate list. But um, in either case, both of these graphs show uh, an increased application of uh, the ESA to protection of marine species. There's also been a change in taxonomic focus through time. Uh, the initial listings were for the classic marine megafauna, um, whales and other marine mammals and sea turtles. 
following a period of relative inactivity in the 80s, there was a shift in focus to um, listing attempts for uh, Pacific salmonids. I'm sure many of you in the room were actually involved in these efforts. And um, the discussion over whether uh, particular uh, salmon uh, runs could be designated as distinct population segments led to the definition of the evolutionarily significant unit, a term which has um, been applied since uh, in both marine and terrestrial um, settings in this useful distinction. And since uh, the push to list the uh, salmon and steelhead species, there's been a diversification of listings for um, a variety of species, including listing of the first uh, fully marine sp um, fish, the uh, small tooth sawfish in just this past year, uh, listing of the first marine invertebrate, white abalone in 2001, and the first marine plant, Johnson's seagrass, down there at the bottom in 98. So I want to walk you through just a couple quick case studies, starting with white abalone, which was, as I said, listed as endangered in um, May of 2001. If you could look out the window here, you would be looking out over um, habitat for some of the last remaining individuals of the first marine invertebrate to be listed as endangered. Um, a white abalone, uh, unfortunately for it, is a very tasty marine snail. It's found at about 100, meter, 100 feet depth uh, on rocky reefs uh, in the Channel Islands and along the coast here, south to Baja. Uh, it was exploited commercially uh, starting in 1967. The fishery um, catches peaked in 72, and then the, the fishery had basically collapsed by um, a short 10 years later. And uh, the overall decrease in abundance was over 99.9%, down to a mere 2,000 or so individuals. Densities are so low in the field now that um, there's no successful reproduction. And uh, recovery of the species is going to depend on reintroduction of hatchery-raised individuals, if it's to happen at all. Um, take home message is that we have fished this species to the brink of extinction. Our second case study was on Boccaccio, which is a Sebastes or rockfish species found also on the west coast of the U.S. Um, this species was petitioned for listing in 2001 following a precipitous decline of over 96 percent in less than 10 years. And um, the petitioners cited over uh, utilization through direct and indirect harvest in groundfish fisheries as the major cause of decline in this species. They also implicated persistent um, regulatory failure. And in fact, NIMFS in the 12-month finding um, stated that um, the past management uh, actions have been inadequate to protect the species. The southern stock of Boccaccio has been heavily overutilized during the entire period of council management. Nonetheless, Boccaccio was not listed by NIMFS. Citing recent conservation measures that the council has taken, they decided to place the, um, the species on the candidate list. Boccaccio, like many um, commercially harvested species, experiences high recruitment variability. Um, you can see on the graph here, in the early 60s, there were um, several years of poor recruitment that are represented by that dip in, in stock abundance. And the 96% decline that I mentioned, though a large relative decline, um, in absolute numbers, the population dipped to 1.6 million fish. So there's a, um, a real issue here in how we set the, um, the criteria for uh, extinction risk for species that experience such high population variability and differences in how people um, use uh, percent declines as a measure of risk explain some of the variation among the different lists that have been published of vulnerable marine species. For example, the nearly 80 percent of the um, threatened marine species on the IUCN list are there under criterion A, which is a criterion based on overall um, percent decline of adult abundances. Right, so in our chapter, um, after looking at the, sort of the history of listings, we go on to look at various threats to marine species. These are um, surveyed much more comprehensively in the recent Pew Oceans Commission's report. What we focused on specifically was how these threats related to particular endangerment of species. Um, 
the categories we chose are to somewhat, somewhat overlapping. They often act synergistically. All are involved in the endangerment of some marine species. I'm not going to go through them all. I'm going to pick out two examples. First, I want to emphasize fishing. Um, unlike terrestrial ecosystems, where current hunting practices are given a relatively low score in terms of a threat to endangered species, um, fishing uh, is very prominent in the marine environment. It affects directly targeted species, not just by taking their abundance, but by changing the age, size, sex, social, and genetic structure of populations, but it doesn't just hit the, um, targeted species, it also hits non-targeted species as well, obviously through very high bycatch rates, through habitat destruction associated with certain gear types, and also through community interactions that propagate impacts as well. And that small tooth sawfish, the first fully marine fish to be listed, the primary threat to that species was bycatch. Um, the second example I want to show you con concerns a, a weak fish from the Gulf of California in Mexican waters. You can see it in that sort of blurry picture up in the top corner there. Um, but I want to emphasize this image down here, which is a, a large school of totoba, this Mexican weak fish. You're not going to see this anymore. This is, I think, it's a stunning image. But you're not going to see it anymore because they're critically endangered. Their mistake was to rely obligately on the uh, Colorado River Delta for spawning habitat. Now, outflows from that delta have effectively ceased because of water diversion for crop irrigation and municipal water needs in the southwest. So there are interesting transboundary issues that come out as well. With both of these species, you also see the synergism that's affecting threats as well. Uh, Water, diversification, uh, water diversion was the primary threat here, um, but this species was also fished commercially. Um, similarly, bycatch was the primary threat for the small tooth sawfish, but there's also a suggestion that degradation of estuarine habitats has also contributed. Um, just as there are diversity of threats, we need a diversity of strategies to meet them. Um, largely reflecting the expertise of the authors, we focused on two approaches. First of all, instead of beyond reserves, we started with reserves and we had a look at what an ecologically effective network of marine reserves could do to help us protect endangered marine species. So again, the emphasis is on the endangered species, but we also wanted to emphasize that reserves aren't enough. So for us, it's not beyond reserves, it's reserves and beyond. Um, they're not enough because some of the threats to endangered species are non-excludable and some of the endangered species themselves are highly migratory and will not be contained in uh, reserve boundaries. So we were looking at um, integrated seascape management approaches of which uh, reserves are one part. We looked at uh, ecosystem uh, level uh, management of fisheries as an example of that using the stellar sea line. Um, Jeff asked us to think a little bit about um, the interaction this morning of the ESA with other acts. There are obviously other acts that work in the marine environment. Um, so the Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Sustainable Fisheries Act under National Standard 1 have both, uh, to some extent, regulated takings of species. Um, they also have at their heart more conservative goals than the ESA. So the Marine Mammal Protection Act, the goal is to maintain marine mammals as functioning elements of their ecosystems. So it's preventing functional extinctions, not full extinctions. Uh, the Sustainable Fisheries Act aims to uh, provide optimum yield on a continued basis to U.S. fisheries. Again, it's a more conservative target. So uh, for the species covered by those acts, the role of the ESA is really to bolster those acts. Um, uh, and if the more flexible management they offer fails, it it adds a bit of teeth that will uh, help protect species that are still sliding towards extinction. But perhaps the more important role for the ESA is a safety net because those acts are taxonomically restricted and some of the species we care about are going to fall through the gaps in the legisla legislation. Um, so Johnson seagrass will not be captured by either of those. So the ESA has an important role making sure all species receive some measure of protection. Now we are here to discuss the 30th birthday of the ESA. Um, but not too long ago, the Stratton Report went through its 30th anniversary, and that was the first comprehensive review of U.S. ocean policy. Now, that anniversary spawned two independent commissions looking at uh, the state of the ocean environment and ocean management. The Pew Oceans Commission and Jeff Heal, who started this session, is actually one of the ocean commissioners, so we're lucky to have Jeff here today, and also the U.S. Government Commission on Ocean Policy. The Pew Ocean Commission reported earlier this year interim findings for the uh, U.S. Commissioner up, and the other findings are to come out, the final findings come out soon. Um, amongst their findings, one of the recommendations was that we need to integrate and consolidate ocean policy. The, uh, the, ocean, the U.S. Commission on Ocean Policy went as far as to describe it as a, a Byzantine patchwork of regulations, which I thought was fairly poetic for them. Um, but if we're going to talk about integrating across ocean policy, we would suggest that the ESA has an important role in those discussions. Um, and for this current uh, group of people in the room, we would suggest that if you want to talk about the future of the ESA, you have to also think about marine applications. Um, so in conclusion, marine biodiversity is, is rich in biodiversity, it's important and it's in trouble. 
is facing a diversity of threats. Um, that will need a diversity of aggressively implemented strategies, but amongst those, we do see an important role for the ESA to play. Um, and the ESA is growing in prominence and breadth of application in marine ecosystems. And lastly, I want to go back to something Bruce Babbitt said yesterday. This is my attempt at scratching it down, so I hope it's a quote and not a paraphrase. Um, what makes the ESA special is regulation. It's not confined to any one medium. It reaches out anywhere that a species is threatened or endangered. Now, we wanted to have all of these windows open because if you look outside, there are endangered and threatened species right outside the window. And it would do a lot of good if some of the intellectual capital in the room and some of the expertise with the ESA could focus for a little bit on how we can help improve a lot of those species. Thanks very much.